for uh, Waitaki, but yes. also thank you, Jackie, for coming up. Um, Jackie's got major fires mm. in her electorate, mm. and um, she's come up really, I think, because this is a very, very important policy, but she'll be straight back to yes, the electorate will. after this. Yeah. And Simon O'Connor, who is the spokesperson for social housing, I'm an associate spokes, uh, spokesperson for housing. So today in uh, Papakura, we want to uh, make some announcements. Obviously, uh, those of you who saw the debate on Wednesday night would have heard me talking yet again about need to uh, take out the RMA. Um, I've often been described as, I have occasionally described it as taking out the back and shooting it. Um, and that is something that we do need to do. It's not that the RMA didn't start off with all the right intentions of the people who um, put it together, but over the years it's become a monolithic um, block on development. We had some very uh, good progress with the special housing areas, which um, our colleague Nick Smith put in place when we were in government, and this is actually one of those areas. And we've been hearing this morning um, from the developer, Daniel Knackley, about just how the special housing areas and the rules around affordable housing um, and what could be done. Oh, Ardmore Airport's just down the road, by the way, team. That's why that is. Let's wait for that. We've been hearing from the developer of this particular subdivision um, how the special housing area actually meant that the planning requirements of this uh, subdivision took around seven months as opposed to around seven years. Unfortunately the current government decided to scrap all of that and then ended up with a situation where they found it very hard to get the Kiwi built houses built, which as you know they promised bigger on with 16,000 built by this time and they've got from last count 585, so that's hardly um, anywhere near their requirements. The special housing areas if they've been left in place would have actually enabled more houses to get built faster and, um, and as we've also heard this morning being able to have the special housing areas with them having a requirement not only for speed but also of having affordable housing as part of that mix actually meant that the subdivision ended up with another 61 houses than it would have done otherwise. Um, so actually it was a very good system that was working well for those who wanted to make it work well. Unfortunately now we have a situation where that has been uh, taken away. What we've seen is that house prices have continued to go up, not down, up 27% at the last count, and the state house waiting list has quadrupled under the current government. We thought five, having 5,000 families in the state house waiting list was um, a bit tough in, when we left office in 2017. Now to find out there's almost 20,000 families um, homeless on state house waiting list gives a very good indication at how the current government having promised so big on housing, has failed miserably. After nine years of blocking all the efforts that we made to reform the RMA by not providing support or any uh, assistance at all in getting sensible legislation through, um, uh, last year I offered assistance to the current government to help them bring about better um, RMA reform. That was turned down and all we've suddenly heard on Friday the uh, leader of the Labour Party announcing that now the RMA is a problem, having two days before announced on te national television that it wasn't a problem. So clearly um, it's nice that she's come to us on this, but it's a bit late. We believe that the RMA needs to go, but in the meantime it's going to, we need to get housing started, and because it will take some time to get new legislation in place. Um, I'm, continue, I'm continuing to be concerned at the way in which um, housing is still very unaffordable and in fact it's gone backwards. But we know that we can get these things done and we have had success in this not only in special housing areas but particularly in Christchurch after the earthquakes where what we did is to require the rezoning or zoning of 30 years of growth immediately and Christchurch house prices stabilised as builders could get on and get the building done and developers could have confidence in the processes. So Christchurch now has more affordable housing than any other major centre in New Zealand. And with interest rates falling to record lows and the Reserve Bank 
adding a billion dollars worth of money into the economy through money printing, there is a risk of another cycle of house prices rising. House prices are almost 10 times household incomes now in Auckland, severely unaffordable by international standards. So we will repeal the RMA in our first term, but faster action is now needed. National will act quickly in government so we can put the measures in place that we want prior to completing work on the RMA replacement and will implement the same approach that we took in Christchurch. We will pass emergency legislation in the first 100 days that requires councils to zone 30 years of growth. We will suspend the appeals process to allow councils to fast track council district plans and we will streamline the resource consenting process to allow people to build houses faster. National will also better support community housing. We will continue Kainga Ora or Housing New Zealand's build programme, but we will set aside $1 billion for community housing providers. We've already seen the work that these people have been doing, people like the Housing Foundation, producing really good high quality social housing and then managing it properly. We, can, we will continue the rent to buy scheme, extending this to state house tenants who have a good track record. We will also make renting more affordable. We will repeal Labour's changes to the Residential Tenancy Act, particularly those around uh, getting rid of tenants or exiting tenants who have been antisocial. And uh, we will also remove the right for tenants to make um, substantial changes to a rental property without permission of the landlord. The, the current um, changes to the Residential Tenancy Act that the government has put in limit the ability to stop a tenant undertaking the renovation, alteration or addition. That is simply not good enough um, and it is not acceptable for this to occur. What we've seen is that renters in the end lose from over-regulation of the market with rental prices actually increasing in the last three years by $50 a week. Housing issues in New Zealand are now extremely serious and we're the only party that's actually got a plan to deal with this. So the way of dealing with this is to uh, look at this and say who gets stuff done, we get stuff done. In terms of state house tenants I'd say to them they have nothing to fear from us. In fact with us they will have more housing available but even better that if they are in a position as uh, their own situations improve, financial situations improve, that they will be able to apply to be able to buy their home on a rent to buy scheme. This is something that we've seen, um, I've certainly uh, in my very first uh, working job as a lawyer uh, was dealt with these schemes. It is absolutely hardcore national party policy to get people into home ownership and what I've seen over the years is a lot of rent can be paid and actually nothing at the end of it. And it is really important that we help families get themselves onto um, into property that they own, that they can leave to their children, gives them a real permanent stake in the community, and it gives them utter certainty. How's the thinking behind um, dropping the Bright Line test from five years back down to two years? Well, that's all about actually increasing the supply of rental properties for people uh, to be able to invest and what we've seen uh, the bright line test going up to five years all that's done is make it more difficult for people to be enticed into being landlords in the market. Is right now the right time to give tax cuts to property investors? Do you know right now is the right time to get more people providing more houses for people to rent. Um, we, we are not, well it does actually, it does, it does. When we are looking at a quadrupling in the state house waiting list, we are looking at homelessness worse than we've ever seen, we're looking at food banks finding it worse than they've ever seen it, now is actually the time to get more people who actually have confidence to go and get houses built to put tenants in. Actually we need to get things. It actually gives a tremendous amount of incentive for people to build new housing as well and I think it's, um, we are not the party of envy, we're the party of getting stuff done. How realistic is it for state home um, tenants to buy into a rent to, step, a rent to buy policy? Um, many are still, like on the bread line, you know, as it is money wise at the moment. Well it is very realistic and we've certainly seen it over the years with other governments like national governments and we've seen it actually transform people's lives. 
So it's not going to be for everybody, but for those tenants who are managing very well and have a very good track record, and also remembering that uh, where tenants themselves end up with more income, that they'll have a real reason to do that because they'll be able to actually start to pay off their house. Rent to buy schemes are something that, um, which, you know, they've been called shared equity by the, the Labour Party and the Greens. They never actually put it in place. We're happy to put it in place and we're calling it rent to buy. Do you have any do you, do you, Why is the emergency amendment necessary if you're going to scrap the RMA anyway? Because it will take some time to get the RMA um, in place and replacement because it will be two acts, one on environmental standards and the other on um, development and what we can't, we cannot afford to just go another three years waiting for something to happen. It is absolutely crucial. Do you want to say to you about the uh, appeals process being scrapped? Well I say this, I'm more worried about people living in cars. Do you want to see house prices go down to make it more affordable? I think it's really important, um, I don't want to see people's equity disappear. Um, that's really important. But I do want house prices to be more affordable for people. And the best way of doing that is actually just getting more houses built. But, 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 but in order to make them more affordable, it's income levels to house price. So you either get income levels up or house prices down to make it more affordable. Or for some reason, the government subsidises people to get into their first home. So what is the situation? Subsidies don't actually, don't, subsidies to get people into their first homes don't make them more affordable because all it does is that it ends up being put on the price of their house. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been tried before. Um, sorry, Thomas? No, but so you either have to get house prices to go down or incomes to go up. So which way, which one is it? To you make can do more both. Affordable? You can do both. And one of the ways of doing that is actually just having more choice for people. So if you're if you've got a house that's in an area which is highly desirable for various reasons, you're probably not going to find that dropping. But what you will do is if you have more affordable houses available, then people will be able to buy um, their houses and you know it, it'll be cheaper because there's more in the market but also if we speed up the time of actually planning and consenting as we did with the special housing areas you can actually get more houses built um, in a more ex inexpensive way but actually a better quality of house. You said, but if there you said are, in the latest debate that you wanted house prices to drop in some areas, what are those areas? Um, I think that there are some houses that are simply far too expensive uh, for what people can afford. I'd like to see more affordable housing available, um, certainly for first home buyers, and the best way of doing that is to build more houses. What, what so which, which areas? And I've just much? said first home buyers. What about by areas of the country though? Oh, I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about areas in terms of first home buyers. By so how much? By how much should they drop? Well, I think what we see is um, we have more supply, what we've seen in Christchurch, is that they stabilise and if they drop, they drop a little bit. Could you put a what? figure on it? No, I'm not going to do that. What, what is, do what is your idea? Week in Auckland, the average house price um, hit a million dollars, for example. Should it be a million dollars? Depends where you're buying, but I have to say that a lot of people are exiting Auckland for that very reason. It's too expensive so what, for a lot of people. Well, what, look. What will it be under the national government? <laughs> that is actually something that the market will determine. But the more houses that are out there, um, the more cho choices people have the less likely people are to have to continue to rent at very high prices, you're going to find more people buying their own house. I'm not going down a track, I'm not going down a track of, of setting house prices. We're not the communists. Do you, do you have any target on your rent to buy scheme? Yeah, I actually think to start off, it would be really good to be able to go through and do a full stock take of who might be um, eligible in terms of it. Um, it's something that I think if people understand that it's available, that we've done it before, um, and what we've seen is um, people actually really getting a stake in the ground that they know and they have something to leave their children. So I'm not going to set a target, but I think it is important that we consider that it's been done before. My very first law job was in Housing New Zealand when we were doing exactly that. What about a ballpark, though? I mean, you know. No, I'm not going to set ballparks. I'm saying is we'll set the policy up and then we'll, we'll um, look at it very thoroughly. Can and you make sure we do In terms of the carving out the $1 billion for Ka of mm. Kainga Ora's funds mm -hmm. to community housing providers, I mean, you're selling, you're selling state homes to, yes, to um, people in, in them, you know. You're shifting a bunch of that money towards community housing pro providers and therefore off the government books. Are you looking to reduce the number of state homes the government has? No, I'm not at all. And you in fact, building to replace the ones that are sold? Well, of course. How many will you build? Whatever we sell. 
And can you explain more about the emergency legislation and the sort of pause on um, council zoning and that sort of thing and what that will mean for a city like Auckland? You know what it will mean? It will mean that um, the city of Auckland, which will also itself be under review, um, will be focused on getting houses built and getting land zoned. What it also does if we, uh, if councils have to zone up to 30 years of growth. What that actually means is you, it's a way of preventing land banking as well, because as it is at the moment, um, if areas of land are deemed to be uh, rural or something like that, but it's obvious that eventually the city's going to move to that area, um, people land bank. What that means is that they buy up land and they just sit on it, and they wait until it's zoned residential before they do anything. So once it's zoned already residential, it's already put in there, there's no incentive at all for anyone to hang on to that land. They've got a real incentive because the rates go up on it, you see, once it's rezoned. And they have a real incentive to get developing and get the, the houses built. That's about using the market, not actually abusing the market. Under a national led government, would you like to see the end of property investment? No, not at all. Why is that Auckland review that you announced this morning necessary? Or Auckland Council review, sorry. Because anyone who pays rates in Auckland Council at the moment is wondering what we're getting for our money. Um, and I think too is that Auckland Transport in particular has been an absolute disaster, particularly the last few years, uh, where they seem to have lost all connection uh, with the people who are paying the bills, the ratepayers who they should be there for. Um, just go to Auckland City and have a look and see why it is that shops are shutting all over the place. And that was before COVID. Why do, what, what sort of changes do you expect to come out of that review? Well, we're not going to set the, um, obviously, what the results are before we start a review. But in the first 100 days, we'll have the review's terms of reference and we'll also have the reviewers in place. Would you, you like to see Auckland Transport, Transport answerable to the council, for example? Well, I think that that will be something dealt with the review. Would you, would you, would you maintain the, the government's... Mm. What did you mean by that? I actually thought it was... Um, if you think about any other religion... If people take a moment uh, to pray, people actually don't say anything, do they? And yesterday I attended um, at the St Thomas Anglican Church, not a church I, I've been to before, and um, the minister asked if I would like to take a moment to pray. I'm an Anglican, I'm a confirmed Anglican. Of course I'm going to take that moment to pray. I didn't ask the media to come with me. And the fact is, is that, you know what, I just think that people should never make uh, assumptions about other people's faith and particularly someone who has already publicly stated my faith before. Faith is a personal thing. I didn't ask the media to come with me. Um, I could of course have tried to order people out of the church. Imagine what that would have been like. And actually, do you know what? I'm not ashamed to be a Christian. I'm happy to be one. How many times a year do you go to church? Um, actually several times a year and I go to Catholic churches as well as Anglican churches, Presbyterian and Methodist and everything else because that is part of what I do as an electorate MP. But one of the things with being a Christian, you don't have to go every week to church. You can pray. I pray every day. Thank you for asking. Would you maintain the government? Have you always prayed before you vote? No, I was simply asked by the uh, minister if I would like to take make a prayer. Actually, as an Anglican, I see no problem with that. That's After nice. all, it is Sunday. Nice would you maintain the government's current um, state house building pipeline? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. is, there, is, there, is there any um, substance to the accusations that are being made that you are politicising your faith? No, actually, I, I find that deeply offensive. Do, are, you, are, you, are you looking for the Pacific vote? Because that's, that's one of the things that have been said. You know, I, I, I think people need to perhaps understand me a bit more. What you get with me is, you know, you're going to get exactly what you see, which is someone who actually does believe. Um, I found that utterly offensive. Cabinet today is deciding whether to move Auckland down to level one. Do you think that it should, and what kind of impact would that have on Auckland? Well, it obviously has to go to level one. This is getting utterly beyond a joke. We've got. Um, no community transmission that we're told about anyway, I presume there's none. Um, we've got, they should have the COVID app operating. Uh, the government should have put in place a Bluetooth tracking um, mechanism as well, which they don't seem to have sorted out yet. They should have been testing people before they get on a plane to come to New Zealand. Um, they should have done a lot of things. They should have, by the way, done the testing at the border that they said that they were going to do, which they didn't do. So, yeah, I think actually Auckland needs to be in level one. And I'm going to make that call without the advice of that the Prime Minister has, because quite clearly 
uh, she's happy to leave this country in lockdown. We have an economic crisis that we're about to move into. This country needs to get moving, it needs to get moving now. You're, you um, would reverse the uh, Residential Tenancies Amendment Act mm. and um, clarify some of the, uh, what was it, the healthy homes um, points. Is there anything that yeah. you would bring in for renters? Yep. Well, we, we have said that we will have another look at the heating requirements which are part of the healthy homes regulations because I don't know if you've had a look but there's this great big long mathematical um, equation which needs to be addressed and, and it's simply beyond uh, many landlords to make that calculation for heating. Now that's one of the barriers to being a landlord and that is one of the measures that we're going to have a close look at. What we want for renters and landlords are simple, clear, practical and pragmatic regulations so that they can do what they want and what they want to live in which is warm, dry, healthy homes. And so we are committed to uh, getting rid of those uh, parts of the healthy homes regs, which is the, around the heating. And we're also committed to making it um, easier for a landlord to deal with a situation where they have an ongoing situation with a tenant who isn't paying their rent or who is uh, creating a public nuisance or creating damage. Now under these regulations it's very difficult for a tenant to get the evidence together on three separate occasions then take it to the tenancy tribunal and it's very hard to deal with the situation which is happening and that's not good for either party. That's certainly not good for neighbours is it? Oh no it's terrible for neighbours and mm. look in my own community in Omaru mm. um, I've had that very situation where there has effectively been a party house and you know beer bottles it's the classic oh, it's party it. house beer bottles everywhere and cars up and down the drive and the landlord uh, their hands are tied, um, the council their hands are tied, the police their hands are tied and we simply need to find a way through because if we make being a landlord less attractive then there will be less rental housing on the market but and that further puts pressure on social I asked housing. you what you're doing for renters and you've gave, given me a very landlord heavy answer so are you oh. not you don't want to see renters empowered more and you've also oh, sort of given okay. the yeah, example yeah. of a party house but that doesn't fairly represent the majority of renters. Okay it's the best way to help renters is to have more landlords available to actually build new houses so that there is more choice for tenants that's the best way. That's the best right. way is to get ourselves in situation where there are landlords are making deals just to get the right tenants basically that they want. Mm -hmm. That is what we want. We want tenants to have choice. Tenants at the moment don't have choice other than to a, a car or pay $50 a week more than what they were when we were in government. That's what you do. We don't help tenants by bashing landlords. We help tenants by having more people willing to get houses built to help put tenants in. Sorry? That's entirely up to people to make their own choices. Would your party not? It's the market sets the rent. No, no, people, people need to make their own choices. It is important. We don't believe that we are a nanny state. We believe absolutely that people need to make their own choices. But we also understand this, is that the more rental accommodation available means that tenants get more choices. Would your party uh, commit to bringing 17-year-olds into their youth uh, justice system and stopping holding young people in police cells for more than 24 hours? No. Why not? Because they're not in police cells other than because they're either a danger to themselves or they're a danger to other people. And what about bringing 17-year-olds into the youth justice system? No. Again, why not? Uh, because they're in the system because often of very serious issues. Um, this is something that um, we need to be very aware of. Is, And I suggest that if anyone doubts that, they should go and visit some of the... Uh, youth residences as I have and I'm sure that uh, Simon has as well. Um, in some cases unfortunately we're dealing with people who have committed very serious offences and even though they are legally children, those offences, that doesn't matter if you're a victim. Just in the lead up to the 2017 the, the election... Um, Sorry, just back on the level one decision, you said mm. there's no community transmission that we've been told about. What do yep. you mean by that? Well we don't know of any, so unless there's an announcement today um, unless you know of the announcement today, I can't see any. Is there an announcement today? Um, what we're being told quite a lot. No, I'm a lawyer, so I always question. So lawyers do that. That's part of the job. I always question. And if I haven't, there's an announcement apparently at one o'clock. I'm, I'm not privy to what that announcement is. In the lead up to the 2017 election, um, National said that in its, well, ended up being its final term in government, there were 
um, 80,000 homes built mm -hmm. during those three years. In, in the coming three years, how many homes do you want built? Well, I can't give you that exact number. Have you got an idea on that one? Yeah, as many as we can. Yeah, as as many many as we can. Yeah. yeah, the main thing is um, to empower people to get out there and do it. If Labor said yeah. as many as we can can we build as they did, you laughed at them. Do you know what? I'm, I'd be laughing a lot less than uh, I am now. 16,000 houses they said they'd have built by now. They've got 585, unless there's you know another one that's being finished so today. Number? The number is whatever we can get done. Yeah. We've, can we build, but how many houses are you going to build? Well, Kiwi Build's got no numbers attached, have they now? Um, I think the point is, is understanding that if we put in place the right mechanisms, the private sector will do its job. Because that's the thing with Kiwi Build, it was never actually a government build. It was always going to be the private sector and developers having to do all the work because the government, strangely enough, doesn't tend to employ carpenters or builders. But the, um, you, you've said today that you'd, you'd effectively um, carry on the government's, you know, house building pipeline right so mm, of course because as they did ours that's yeah. why they've got some houses built so, in the state house so you're basically is. saying you will build as many homes as this car as mm. the current government says they will build well that's state houses and community houses yes mm. but that's not most houses aren't that most houses are private house mm. houses how will that reduce the social housing wait list if you're just going to build the same amount well we have more private houses as well which means that private landlords which means that actually there's more um choice for for renters on the, on the alert levels, uh, what do you make of the fact that Cabinet didn't make an implicit decision so Auckland can't potentially move alert levels tonight, they have to wait 48 hours because of the health order, what do you make of that? Well, nothing much surprises me with this government, it's basically hiding behind COVID for everything, isn't it? So you'd better ask them. On the Auckland, uh, Auckland Council review, why was Denise Lee not part of that announcement? Uh, because it's an announcement I made on radio this morning um, and it was important for me. Actually, Jenna, um, mm -hmm. it's been prepared for a couple of weeks, and it's something there because I was doing the radio show. Jackie Dean, what is the average rent in your electorate? In my electorate, it's about for a three-bedroom house, it's about three hundred dollars a week. Is that in Wanaka, it's more. It's getting up to the five hundred a week. Waimati, uh, it's probably marginally less than that. So I've got highs and lows in my electorate. Depends. Do you think it's affordable? Oh, I th look, I think that certainly in parts of the electorate we have uh, we have lower rentals, and that is why those towns are beginning to experience growth in population as people move into those towns. I think that's a good thing actually, because what is also happening in my electorate is that more houses are being built at the same time. But what we really need is for all of the councils in my electorate to be planning for the future needs of the population and zoning land uh, to be suitable for housing so that we can get on and build houses where and when they're needed. Why have you chosen to be here in Auckland today when um, there's a civil defence emergency in your electorate? <laughs> because I, really I, specifically, I specifically asked Jackie to be here. Jackie has a very significant portfolio in housing and it's one that um, we've worked on a lot uh, with Simon and Jackie and myself. It is absolutely crucial, not only for her electorate, for others, um, but she's only coming up for the day and she's back to her electorate where she was, um, she's been active and she'll continue to be as active as she always is, which is a very active and excellent local MP as well as a future minister yeah. again. So I, I called in mm. to Twizel yesterday afternoon. I had been in Wanaka for a meeting earlier on in the day, so I drove through to Twizel and I met with the two local mayors involved in the welfare aspect of it. Of course, the firefighting is happening up at, at, up at Lake Ohan, so I couldn't get up there because it was off limits to people like me. But I had a briefing with the mayors and with the welfare manager. I was assured that all, there's a hundred, over a hundred people, they are housed, they are fed, they've got future plans for the next couple of days. And I also offered uh, that my staff, who are excellent actually, mm. at looking after people to be available, as they always are, for anyone who needed any help. And my staff are waiting on hand. When I get back, um, I'll go and be, be going back out there just to make sure that there's nothing that I can do. Because um, what I do do as the local MP is that whenever there's something serious, whether it's a fire or a flood or anything, I get there, I get the briefing, and I do what I can to help. Thank you. Does That's enough. 
Of course we do. We also believe in responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? It's all about getting housing built. So I also believe in human rights, and I want to get houses built. Are you basically declaring a state of emergency on housing? Well, it's quite clearly it is now. Um, when we've got 20,000 families, or almost 20,000 families, on the state house waiting list, yeah, I think it is an emergency now. And, and, and housing is a human right? Well, to me it is. I mean, it may not be for some, but to me it is. Um, I don't like... I do, I do not take pleasure in seeing people living in cars. Just thank in, you. In, in Wellington, there's been a lot of problems. Thanks, that's enough, thank you. Thank you.